On Friday the 10th of April 1835, two sisters by the name of Betty and Peggy Stewart were working here in Mullins Wood in the Black Isle for the Kilcoy estate, replacing small fir trees that had been frost damaged over the winter. Betty and Peggy had brought with them two local children to help. Jane Stewart was 13 and Alexander Stewart was 11 at the time. It was 8 o'clock in the morning and there was a cold April wind in the air. So when Jane and Alexander came across the ruins of an old cottage, they decided to take a break from the cold in its ruined walls. Within the walls, Jane spotted a brown glove laying on the ground, and in the corner of the ruin, poking out of a heap of stones was a piece of black gauze. Thinking it had been discarded and could be useful as a veil for her doll, Jane attempted to pull the black gauze free from the rubble, but no matter how much she tried, she could not free it. Just then, Betty and Peggy happened upon the scene. After wondering where the children had went, after being shown the black gauze, both sisters attempted to free it from its holding place, but also failed, standing back to assess the situation. The sisters noticed part of a shoe sticking out from the other end of the rubbish pile. This piqued their interest even further. They removed some of the stone from around the shoe, and to their horror, realised there was a foot in the shoe. Go and get Mr Forbes, said Betty to the children. As quick as you can and tell him to hurry. This is the story of the last man to be executed in Inverness. Join us as we uncover the story of John Adam. John Adam was born into a farming family in 1804 in the parish of Wintrathen, which lies in the foothills of the Grampian Mountains. As he grew up, John was a well-behaved lad, that while he didn't excel at school, he didn't stand out in a negative or positive way. Just your average youngster that attended school and church and did what was required of him. At the age of 19, John found he had an extreme fondness for the opposite sex, which would bring him to the attention of the local parish board after getting a couple of girls pregnant, one of which was deaf and dumb. He was in line to take over the family farm, however, thanks to his newfound inner rebel, he lost all interest in pursuing that career and left the farm to his younger brother James. Due to pressure from the concerned minister of the parish, who worried about his womanising ways and the fact he was facing having to support the illegitimate children he had fathered, John slipped away quietly from the area. He next pops up in a country estate in Fife, working as an agricultural labourer. While working at the estate, he got into a relationship with the assistant cook at the estate, a Jane Breakin. Jane was 15 years older than John, and she quickly became besotted with John, often telling her female colleagues at the estate just how much in love she was with him. As the relationship progressed, Jane pressured John to make an honest woman of her and marry her. This was never his intention, and when the pressure got too much, yet again, John slipped away from the area, leaving a heartbroken Jane behind. John went on to enlist in the army. Initially based in York, the regiment marched for 13 days to Edinburgh in 1832, where they were based for one year. During his time in Edinburgh, John, while on a period of leave, visited Jane Breakin once again and rekindled the romance. In 1833, his regiment left Edinburgh to take up a post in Nottingham, meaning John yet again left Jane behind. While in Nottingham, John frequented a pub called the Red Lion Inn in Derby. It was here he met and fell in love with the 16-year-old assistant cook, a girl by the name of Dorothy Elliott. Out of the blue, John turned up one day at the inn wearing his normal clothes rather than his usual army uniform. He told Dorothy he had bought his discharge from the army and asked her to leave with him as he was going back to Scotland. Young Dorothy was hesitant as her parents would never agree, but John seems to have had strong skills in persuasion, as after a couple of days, Dorothy left with John on his journey back to Scotland. Later, it was revealed John hadn't bought his discharge as he claimed. He had in fact deserted. Not only that, but he had also stolen money from the barracks. While he travelled to Scotland, he would have been well aware the army were looking for him. His first stop was his family farm, where he introduced Dorothy as his wife. He had promised Dorothy they would marry on a journey to Scotland, but had failed to fulfil that promise, much to Dorothy's displeasure. Well, they were at the family farm. His past was fast catching up with him. The girls who had children with John had enlisted the help of the Kirk to chase John to force him 
to contribute to the upbringing of the children. The army were also hot on his heels. Before the army and the local authorities could take action, John took Dorothy on foot in what must have been a hard and difficult journey, if not for the strong and fit John, but his younger companion. They crossed the Month Mountains to Braemar, then through the Cairngorm Pass and up through Slocht into Inverness. Food and board would have been few and far between on this route, and the mountains would still have been snow covered. It's amazing that they managed to travel the route in eight days. Why he headed to Inverness is not known. It's possible he knew people there. More than likely, he was just trying to put as much distance as possible between him and his pursuers. After spending a short time in Inverness, John and Dorothy moved to Dingwall after he couldn't secure employment in Inverness. In Dingwall, he managed to get work at a local quarry and life settled down for the couple, for a while at least. By the autumn of 1834, work at the quarry was becoming scarce and the couple's financial situation was becoming a little desperate and they were falling behind in their rent. John had still not married young Dorothy as promised, telling her they would not marry them in Dingwall as they weren't from the area. By now, Dorothy's patience was wearing thin and she told John she wanted to return to England and her parents. John calmed her telling her they would return to England together to get married, but he would need to go and see his family to raise the funds for the journey. John left immediately, with Dorothy believing he was travelling to his family's farm. Two weeks later, he returned with just enough money to pay their rent. What Dorothy didn't know was John hadn't been to his family. He had in fact travelled to Montrose to visit a small shop in the town. The owner of that shop was none other than his former love interest, Jane Breakin. As it turned out, Jane had made quite a success of herself since John last seen her. She now ran a successful business in Montrose and was financially comfortable. How John found out about Jane's good fortune is anyone's guess. But when he did, he made sure to pay her a visit to see it for himself. A few months after returning to Dorothy at Dingwall, John received a letter. John informed Dorothy they had been blessed with good fortune. His uncle had died and left him money and some belongings. He must go at once to collect it. Dorothy couldn't read very well, but managed to just about make out the letter was from Montrose. Delighted at this turn of good luck, and the fact they could now return home to Derby in England, Dorothy kissed John goodbye as he left to collect his inheritance. The truth, however, was that the letter was from Jane Breakin, informing John she had managed to sell her business and had wound up her affairs in the town. She was now ready to join him in Inverness as they agreed. You see, Jane had never stopped loving John, and blinded by love, she would do anything to be with him. On his previous visit, he had declared his love for Jane, and proposed marriage, telling her he wanted her to join him in Inverness, where they would find their very own love nest to live a happy and carefree life together. Jane was over the moon this new development in her life. Being with John was all she wanted. As John joined Jane back in Montrose after her letter, he did indeed marry her but not before she signed over permission for him to collect her money from the bank. On the 11th of March 1835, as he was marrying Jane in Montrose, he would also send Dorothy some money to keep up with the rent and her living. Jane wasn't dragged over the Cairngorm Mountains like young Dorothy before her. Her and John travelled in luxurious horse-drawn coach to Inverness, where John secured lodgings for Jane in Church Street. He explained he couldn't stay with her as he had to return to work as well as get their new house ready for them to move into. He arrived back to Dorothy in Dingwall, just after midnight that night, where in new clothes he told Dorothy he had acquired with the inheritance. The following day, some items of furniture arrived at the home in Dingwall, which John claimed had been left to him by his uncle. Over the next few weeks, John lived a double life, travelling between Dorothy and Jane. Jane spent her time in Inverness making new friends and attending church. She was described by friends and those that knew her, as a quiet, reserved woman, with coarse features marked by smallpox. Her landlady later described her as a heavy build and unattractive. John was described as tall and good-looking. Most people upon seeing Jane and John together regarded him as mismatched and lacking the spark that most newlyweds would have. On the opposite side of the love triangle, John and Dorothy were held in high regard in Dingwall by all that knew them. John was described as a good sober man, while Dorothy was a pretty, decent, quiet and obliging young lady. Behind closed doors though, all was not well in Dingwall. Previously John had been very attentive to his young partner, 
but recently he had become withdrawn and distant. He would sit for hours in silence at the fireside. Dorothy once again insisted strongly they return to England as promised. John promised he was winding things up in Dingwall and they would return in May. With a date in the plans, Dorothy settled and agreed to wait until May. However, on the 13th of April, 1835, there was a knock on the door of John and Dorothy's home in Dingwall. It was the local police who had arrived to arrest John on the suspicion of murder. He was immediately handcuffed and taken to Dingwall Tollbooth for questioning. If you cast your mind back to the beginning of our uncovering story here, you will remember we told of the discovery of a woman's dead body in the Black Isle. That woman turned out to be none other than our Jane Breakin. Once the body was removed from the scene, the investigation moved at a fast pace. At the autopsy, they found initials J.B. on some of the clothing. Injuries found were a fractured jawbone, two cuts to the head with one match in the corner of a stone that was covering the body. The contents of the stomach contained a liquid matching that of barley broth. The name of the woman found was discovered after handbills were printed and handed out to church service attendees on the Sunday. Jane's landlord thought he recognised the description of the woman as possibly being his lodger, Mrs Jane Adam, and informed the authorities. He confirmed it was indeed Jane after viewing the body. He also informed the authorities that Jane was married to a John Adam. John's description was circulated amongst the Highland Police Force, and officers in Dingwall recognised it as John Anderson, who lived with Dorothy Anderson. While in custody, John denied knowing anything about the woman. He swore he didn't know the name Jane Breakin or anything about her. He was adamant his name was John Anderson and not the John Adam they were looking for and couldn't explain how the officers found clothing in his house embroidered with the initials J.B. One of the strangest parts of this case was that the authorities forced John to do something called ordeal to touch. In medieval times, it was believed that the corpses of murder victims would bleed when touched by the murderer. However, by the late 1800s, it was been used as a way of judging the accused guilt. By watching their reactions during the process, the authorities could look for any signs of guilt. So it was that the area's procurator fiscal, Hugh Cameron, led John Adam to the body of Jane Breakin and firstly asked him to touch Jane's torso. While John did so, Hugh asked him if his hand had ever been there before. John replied it had not. He was then told to touch Jane's breasts and asked if his head had ever rested there. John again replied it had not. Lastly, Hugh Cameron told John to touch Jane's lips and asked if he had ever kissed him. This time, John replied with a shaky no, and Hugh noted John had become emotional and was sweating profusely. Six witnesses came and went at Dingwall Tollbooth, identifying John as John Adam, the husband of Jane Breakin. Despite John's denials, Hugh Cameron was convinced he was lying. He was officially placed under arrest for the murder of Jane Breakin and kept under 24-hour guard at Dingwall Tollbooth while a case was built against him. The Tollbooth jail at Dingwall at this point in time was in a sorry state. After an inspection, it was labelled unfit for human habitation. While John languished in his filthy cell, Hugh Cameron periodically interrogated John about the case. John not only stuck to his denials of being John Adam, but he went much further by fabricating an entirely new life for himself. Speaking of a childhood in Dalkeith, along with a detailed school and work life, he even provided details of his supposed marriage to Dorothy, which included the name of the minister that performed the ceremony and witnesses. He continued to lie that his uncle had left him an inheritance to explain his sudden and recent wealth. Now he claimed the initials in the clothing that was found in his home were J.B. for Jane Bunton, his dead aunt. He signed his statement, John Anderson. By now, the handbill about the murder had made its way across the nation and found its way to some of Jane and John's family and friends from Fife. People were coming forward at a continuous basis to fill in the blank spaces to the story. John was moved to Inverness Tolbooth Jail, which was in a much better condition. As he was escorted from Dingwall to Inverness, the authorities intentionally passed the site of the murder in the hope that John would break down and confess. However, he point-blank refused to look in the direction of the ruined cottage. 
The army turned up in Inverness to see if the man being held was the John Adam that was wanted for desertion. They visited John in his cell and determined it was indeed the same person. The soldiers returned to the regiment and reported John was in custody, suspected of murder. After the visit from his former army colleagues, John must have started to see the strong case Procurator Fiscal Hugh Cameron was building against him. By May 1835, he requested to alter his statement and in the company of Hugh Cameron, he declared he was indeed John Adam. He told the truth about where he came from and his life story up until he visited Montrose to reunite with Jane Breakin. He claimed he had went to Montrose to request the repayment of money he had lent to Jane before he entered the army. He also claimed Jane refused to repay the money until he married her, to which he agreed in order to obtain the money owed. That once married, Jane repaid John his money and they both returned to Inverness together. He also admitted he did not tell Dorothy any of this, instead making up the whole inheritance story to explain the money. Now he declared the last time he seen Jane was when she accompanied him to Keswick Ferry before he returned to Dingwall on the Friday. Jane told him her lodgings were cold and she was going to try and obtain new lodgings. They parted with John returning to Dorothy and never seen Jane again, unless the woman's body he seen was her, but he was unable to tell due to it being so disfigured. The murder trial of John Adam began on Friday the 18th of April, 1835. John stood in the dock at Inverness Court, described at the time as a tall, handsome man, 31 years of age, well-dressed and very bald. Firmly, he pleaded not guilty when asked. An interesting fact of the times in the trial was that some of the witnesses couldn't speak English, such as Jane and Peggy, who found the body, with Gaelic being their only language. Therefore, there was a need for an interpreter to be at the trial. The prosecution had a very strong case, with a lot of witnesses and sound evidence. John's defence argued that he had the financial means to go on the run before being arrested, but didn't, which surely shows the actions of an innocent man. When the prosecution and the defence issued their closing statements, the jury took 45 minutes to reach a verdict. John Adams was found guilty of the murder of Jane Breakin. The judge then placed the black cap upon his head and proceeded to pass sentence upon John Adam. In it, he spoke of John committing sin throughout his life and how the devil had took hold of him. He declared he accepted the jury's verdict as the only possible decision they could make. He touched on how John took advantage of young Dorothy and taken her away from her loving parents to an unfamiliar land. He berated John for using the feelings of these women to get what he wanted, using secrecy and lies as his weapons. He pleaded with John the necessity to repent before God and cleanse his soul by telling the truth. He expressed pain at being in a situation where he was responsible for another man's life before passing the final sentence. He announced, John Adam will be hanged at Inverness on Friday the 16th of October between the hours of 2 and 4 o'clock in the afternoon and his body to be buried within the precincts of the jail. During the sentence being announced, John was reported as staying in his seat and appeared calm. When the final sentence of the death was announced, he rose to stand silently. After sentencing, as he was being led from court, John tried to speak to the jury, but there was so much commotion in the court, only a little could be heard. You have condemned an innocent man, was the words that were heard from him. From the time of his sentence to the day his execution was to take place, John was said to be calm and talkative with his jailers telling them stories of his army days, as well as regrets for his treatment of Jane and Dorothy. Despite the desperate attempts by the local minister to get John to admit his guilt and confess his sins, he always flatly denied the crime he was accused of. Even a final visit from Dorothy, who tearfully pleaded with him to save his soul and confess, could not waver his claims of innocence. On the morning of the execution, John said he had slept well and indulged in a hearty breakfast. As he was escorted from the jail, he turned to thank his jailers for their treatment of him. As he left the jail, he noticed three carriages were there awaiting him. He declared unhappiness at this as he wanted to walk to the gallows rather than being driven and strung up like a dog. It was explained to John that the expectant crowds in the street were of such a great number 
that they could not safely walk to the place of execution. As they made their way to the site, the streets were full of people making their way to the upcoming public spectacle. 200 police constables were in attendance, and a crowd of more than 8,000 attended. On the scaffold, the minister reads parts of the Bible. John stood motionless above the crowds. When it came his turn to speak, he spoke fondly of his mother and friends. He declared he had no fear in meeting his God, as he was an innocent man. A statement that drew gasps from the very religious onlookers. After a few moments silence, John dropped a white handkerchief from his hand to tell the hangman that he was ready. The trap doors opened and down he went. There was a slight struggle before he was still. He hung there for an hour before being taken down, put in a coffin and transported back to the jail. Soon enough, part of the pavement outside the jail was uplifted and John was interred within it. Before being buried under the streets of Inverness, a death mask was taken from John, which still survives to this day and can be viewed and display at the Scottish National Portrait Gallery in Edinburgh. So it would appear that the question of John's innocence will forever hang in the air, with every viewer of this video and reader of the story having their own opinion on the matter like a public judge and jury, quite possibly just the way John Adam wanted it to be. That would have been the case if it weren't for a thief named John Sutherland. When John Adam dressed in his execution robes in the morning of his hanging, he left his clothes in his cell with instructions that they be given to John Sutherland, who occupied the cell next to his, and who he had struck up a friendship with. Sutherland was serving a six month sentence for theft, and after the hanging, he declared that John Adam had told him the true story of the murder of Jane Breakin, with instructions that he would not tell a soul until he was dead. The story Sutherland went on to tell does make a lot of sense and in parts clarifies some points about the victim and the murder scene which weren't known. Sutherland's story of John's confession goes as follows. On the afternoon of Friday the 10th of April 1835, John visited Jane at her lodgings in Inverness to declare that their new home on the Black Isle was now ready for them to move into. Overjoyed, Jane got to packing straight away and they both had a dinner of barley broth before leaving at 6pm. Jane's landlord did comment on them leaving at such a late hour, but Jane couldn't wait to start her new life with the love of her life. They got the Keswick ferry over to the Black Isle and got to walk into their new home. Darkness soon fell upon them and as they passed through a wooded area, they heard a loud cry from within the woods which gave Jane a terrible fright. She grabbed tight onto John's arm as he laughed and told her it was just an owl, don't worry. After walking quite a distance, they came to an open common area called Mubui. They still hadn't reached the place where John had planned to take Jane. Jane stopped to tie her garter, which had loosened on the journey. John realised this was an excellent opportunity to carry out his dirty deed. If he tried to attack her while she was standing, he might have a fight in his hands. Here was a preoccupied and bent over Jane. Quickly, he swiped her legs from underneath her causing her to fall. What are you doing, John? Oh dear me, was all she managed to say before he wrapped his hands round her throat with all his strength, strangled her. When he thought her life was expired, he turned her over and jumped in her until blood came out of her ears. Now that she was dead, he took anything of any value from her before lifting her off the ground and proceeding to make the short journey to the place he had intended to murder and hide Jane. When he came to a dike, he placed the body on it as he climbed over, but as he did so, Jane fell onto the ground and let out a groan. John could see from the moonlight that her lips were moving. In order to stop her making any more noise, by brutal strength, he broke her jaw in two places. After doing her this final dishonour, he concluded Jane took her last breath. He carried the body to an old cottage ruin, but he dumped the body behind a wall and pushed the crumbling wall on top of her. And so it would seem, through the word of John Adams' cellmate, the truth prevailed in the end. Only this is not the end of the story of John Adam. After being buried outside of the Inverness jail, he lay there for 12 years before being removed due to redevelopment in the area. He was then reburied in 1853 under one of the cells of the new police headquarters in Castle Wind. These police headquarters were demolished in 1911 and John's bones were unearthed once again. This time he was reburied under the new building that replaced the old police headquarters. Still, John Adam would not rest, as his bones were again dug up in 1963, 
when Inverness Centre was under redevelopment. This time John spent some time resting on a cupboard shelf until the new headquarters were built in Old Perth Road, where he was once again buried under the cell block. This time the authorities dug a grave at a depth where they would never be recovered. These police headquarters were also demolished and replaced in the 1990s, but as intended, John's bones were not discovered this time. So it is that John Adams lies underneath the car park of the police headquarters today in Old Perth Road, Inverness, where a plaque has been placed in remembrance. While that is finally the end of the story for the murderer and last person to be executed in Inverness, John Adam, what happened to the others that featured in the story? Barely touched upon here, but John Adam was the father to at least three illegitimate children. Helen Adam, born in 1826, never married and died aged 76. John, born in 1826, worked in agriculture and was married with four children. He died at 74 years old. Another John, born in 1830, but we don't know what became of him. Dorothy returned to Derby in England and went on to marry and have five children. She named her first child Jane, which leaves us to wonder if this was in remembrance and respect to the lady that lost her life to the hands of her first love. Dorothy died in 1879, aged 61 years old. Her daughter, Dorothy, also had a daughter she named Dorothy. Could the line of Dorothy's continue until this very day? Who knows? What can be certain is young Dorothy's time in the Highlands was blighted by misfortune. Misfortune brought to her by a man she clearly loved. It would seem, however, she had a lucky escape as there is every possibility she may have ended up in the same scenario as her love rival, Jane Breakin. Thank you for joining us today in this Highland Uncovered. If you would like to know more about the John Adam case, there is a book available right now, written by Graham Clark, that has so much more detail than we have included here. We cannot recommend it enough. We will put a link in the ebook in the description. If you'd like to join us in our next Highlands Uncovered adventure, make sure you subscribe and follow Highlands Uncovered. We shall see you on the next one.